Hey guys, today we are going to learn the route of exposure. First, we need to identify the types of hazards before we determine the routes of exposure. Chemicals can change their physical state depending on temperature or pressure. Thus it is important to identify the health risks as these states can determine the potential route the chemical will take. For example, gas state chemicals will be inhaled or liquid state chemicals can be absorbed by the skin. Basically, there are three types of hazard, which include liquid, gases or fume and flammable materials. Next, we are going to learn the four routes of exposure, which are respiratory system, skin or eye contact, ingestion and injection. This is how hazardous gases or fume enter our body through respiratory system. The gases will first enter our nose, followed by trachea, bronchus, bronchioles and finally reach the alveolus. The second route of exposure is through skin or eye. For your information, eye is considered as part of the skin. Most of the chemicals that pass through skin or eye are commonly in liquid form. Some chemicals can be absorbed into the bloodstream and cross the skin barrier. Once absorbed, they may cause damage to internal organs. As we all know, our skin consists of two layers, the thin outermost layer called the epidermis and a much thicker under layer called the dermis. On the epidermis layer consists of layer called keratin layer which act as a protective layer. Organic and alkaline chemicals can soften the keratin cells and pass through this layer to the dermis where they able to enter the bloodstream. Chemicals can also enter though cuts, punctures or scrapes of the skin since the protective layer is already broken. Next, ingestion also one of the chemical routes of exposure. However, it was the least common route to occur and usually ingestion occurred accidentally or unknowingly. A few examples of ingestion usually occur when an individual eating or smoking with a contaminated hand. As you know, our ingestion system consisting the mouth, esophagus, stomach and lastly the intestine. Once consumed, some chemicals may absorb through the lining of our intestinal tract into our bloodstream. Some chemicals that have a larger structure and cannot get through those linings will stay in our intestine and will be converted into the foreign chemicals in our body. Lastly, injection. Injection is a common type of exposure in the laboratories and in the hospitals. It was a rare occasion for the injection to happen in the chemical industries. However, it may still happen for example when there was a leak point in the pressure vessels. Now. We are going to learn the occupational exposure limit, OEL is an upper limit on the acceptable concentration of hazardous substance in workplace air for a particular material or class of materials. TLV, PEL and OEL are other terms reserved by different organizations for OEL. TLV is not law but a guideline published by the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. It refers to airborne concentrations of substances and represent conditions under which nearly all workers may be repeatedly exposed without adverse health effects. However, due to wide variation in individual susceptibility, a small percentage of workers may experience discomfort from some substances at concentrations at or below the TLV. This is the example of TLV. You can see some abbreviations here and they actually bring certain meanings. Next, we are going to learn some typical time constants. The first one will be TWA, time weighted average, is the contaminant concentration averaged over a period of time. Usually over a full work shift for example 8 hour TWA. Next, SDEL, short term exposure limit is a 15-minute time-weighted average exposure that should not be exceeded at any time during a workday, even if the overall 8-hour TLV TWA is below the TLV TWA. Lastly, C, ceiling, is the concentration that should not be exceeded during any part of the working exposure. This is the formula to calculate TWA. Next, S refers to skin notation which indicates substances for which there is the potential for substantial contribution to exposure via adsorption through the skin. SEN, sensitizer notation, refers to the confirmed potential for worker sensitization as a result of dermal contact and or inhalation exposure. Next, A is the carcinogenicity classification and there are the five classes of it. 
Lastly, BEI, biological exposure indices, is measurement of chemical determinant in a biological media. PEL also called as permissible exposure limit are term that was set by Oshua. It was established in 1970 and also PEL is the term that existed first before any other term such as TLV and REL. 450 chemicals were covered in under this term. This also includes ATAR, TWA, SDEL and C. This is also legally enforceable meaning that is important for all company to comply to this as it is one of the methods of promulgation. Each employer of a company should be familiarized with OSH Act as it is used the foundation for PEL terms. This is how OSH Act being implemented in PEL. The table shown is the examples of PEL this includes the substances, the CAS number, the PPM allowed and the skin designation. There are 29 CFR that includes under offshore standards. Part 1910 until Part 1928 shows part of the 29 CFR that falls under offshore standards. These are the examples of complete standards that fall under 29 CFR Part 1910. IDLH is a concentration limit which exposure of more than 30 minutes would be expected to be fatal. For additional information, Oshaw does not classify carcinogens but relies on classifications made by NTP and IRC. The National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health is part of Centers for Disease Control where it conducts research, recommendation and training duties. For your information, REL is recommendation recommended by it. It is created by the OSH Act and it associated with criteria documents. Usually recommendations set by REL is below PEL limit so often it is used as another guideline but not law.